there has been more innovation at Harvard in the last year than there was in the last century. The pandemic is a terrible human tragedy, but it's also weakened uh, traditional structures and enabled a tremendous amount of innovation. Um, at Harvard, uh, we're building on the work of Harvard's Division of Continuing Education, which had been doing online learning for a long time. I want to make two points about an important shifts that all universities face, not only in Bangladesh, not only in the global South countries, but in everywhere. The first is that, that universities and faculty think that distance education, remote learning is a, a second class way of doing classroom learning. And they don't understand that if face-to-face -face learning is an orange, distance learning is an apple. It's not a small, not very sweet orange, it's an apple. And if you don't see it as a different, then you're not taking advantage of what's possible. Yes, you don't have the same color as an orange, but you can make apple pies with apples and, and do all sorts of other interesting things with apples that you can't with oranges. So policies need to be based not on how do we take classroom learning online, but how do we reinvent learning so that it takes advantage of the strengths of the online medium, capturing a lot of data about each student for personalization, allowing students to learn at their own pace, and so on and so on. And then that leads to the second point I want to make, which is that the most important policies relate to not learning, not faculty learning, but faculty unlearning. All of us as adults struggle with unlearning when the world changes, because our identities are caught up in what was successful before. So you're a great lecturer, and in very large face-to-face -face classes, you can hold everybody's attention. That doesn't work across distance. I don't care how good you are, 45-minute lectures, not going to work. So it's unlearning that. And instead, learning ways of, if you're going to lecture, chunks of 10 minutes, and then activities that allow peer interaction that will work across distance synchronously. So unlearning is, is hard because it's not just intellectual, it's emotional, it's social, it's giving up something that you care about in order to get something new that can be valuable for you. And policies need to stress unlearning as well as learning. I think those are the two areas in which most universities that I see now are falling short in terms of their policies and their practice. But there are two trends that I think are important. One of them is moving away from summative assessment to diagnostic assessment that's formative for learning. So for example, Macmillan, which is a publisher, uh, has a new system for higher education called Achieve. And it's really a student support system. It monitors all the student interactions that are happening online. And if a student is struggling or a student isn't participating or a student seems to be stuck, the system suggests resources immediately that can help the student rather than waiting until it's too late when they get a summative exam and they fail but there's nothing that you can do about it. So you say, well, how do we know ultimately how good the student is? Well, if you have a long series of diagnostic formative assessments, those form a trajectory. And the trajectory tells you as much or more about the student's accomplishments as a summative exam would. Think about if, if your student is doing a, an internship of some kind or an apprenticeship, the person doing the apprenticeship doesn't give them a big exam at the end to see whether or not they learned something. They watch them every day and they help them to get better every day and they watch how fast they're learning. And that is the determination. So that's one big trend that I think is happening everywhere. 
The other is that people are moving away from um, sort of psychometric assessment with lots of little items and multiple choice and short answer to performance-based assessment where you're put into a simulation and you're asked to try to um, resolve this situation. So for example, um, I just showed my students a system called Physics Playground, which gives students a chance to try to solve physics problems in a simulator. And um, a much better sense of what the students know and don't know in an applied way is gained by Physics Playground than would be gained by giving a multiple choice test on Newton's three laws. So I think those are trends that are changing assessment and I think 10 years from now, but now there's two emerging technologies that I think have a lot of promise for making massive learning better. One of them is artificial intelligence based teaching assistants. So Ashok Goal, who is a professor at Georgia Tech in the United States has built and used a number of teaching assistants that take over helping students make social connections, helping answer questions, helping to tutor on difficult subjects, helping with library searches, helping with laboratories. And in turn, what that does is free the human professor to go much deeper in terms of, of relationships with students, personalizing learning for students, even in a very large group. So that has promise in making massive learning better. The other is something that I wrote, co-edited a book about in 2019, and that is engineering learning. One of the great strengths of online learning is that we capture an enormous amount of data about learners um, automatically because we're interacting in a digital way. And that data can be analyzed and used to personalize learning. And I think those models are going to become significantly more powerful in the next five years because of advances in AI and in advances in uh, our ability to capture and analyze big data. So I think it's the most exciting time to be in higher education I've seen during my career.